Um, for those that don't know me, um, my name is uh, Dr. Eric Hong. I'm the Associate Dean for Students in the School of Medicine. And it is my absolute uh, pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Carrie Chen, who is our distinguished visiting lecture speaker today. Uh, I'm gonna start by saying that um, Carrie is this like tour de force inspiration for so many of us in the department. Um, she has centered her um, medical education research program in I think one of the most critical areas that we have in medical um, education, which is around trust. Trust I think for mental health professionals is not necessarily the most groundbreaking topic. Trust is inherent in all of our clinical interactions and therapeutic change. But more importantly, trust is critical for establishing the learning environment that we want our students and residents and fellows um, and all of our learners to learn and thrive in. It's critical in thinking about how we give feedback, um, how we think about advancement decisions, um, and how we create a, a system that really promotes growth and change. And Carrie has really been um, a national leader in thinking very critically about the role of trust in education. Um, Dr. Chen um, is a senior associate dean of assessment and education scholarship, um, a professor of pediatrics, and a member um, of the teaching academy at Georgetown University School of Medicine. She is an, uh, also an adjunct professor of medicine um, in the Uniformed Services um, University of Health Sciences and volunteer professor of pediatrics um, at UC San Francisco. She is no stranger to UCSF. Uh, she completed um, her medical um, degree and pediatric residency at UCSF, where she was um, on our faculty for many years. Um, she held the Abraham Rudolph Chair in Pediatric Education um, and her footprint really touches so many things that we still have um, here at UCSF. Um, Dr. Chen um, not only received a Master of Science in Education um, uh, at USC, um, but she further went on to a doctoral degree um, through a partnership that UCSF has with the University of um, Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, she has um, published widely in the areas of curriculum development, faculty development, and most importantly, assessment, and thinking critically how we develop programmatic assessment to help our trainees learn and grow. Um, I have learned tremendously from Carrie in her work on entrustable professional activities, um, uh, not only a framework, but a way of thinking about workplace-based assessment and um, bringing really the sort of the edge of the learning sciences into the clinical um, and classroom learning spaces. And so it is my absolute, absolute pleasure to welcome Carrie back to UCSF um, and very excited for her talk today on trust within the learning environment. So thank you for that tremendously gracious introduction. I'm always so excited to be back here um, at UCSF. I find this such an inspiring place and I'm so excited to be in your brand new building. This is amazing. Um, so as um, Eric mentioned, we want to talk about trust within the learning environment. And the reason I want to talk about trust is, and as you mentioned, this is something that is all around us, something we tap into implicitly. And I think it can be very helpful to make it explicit in thinking through what trust means and how we utilize it in the learning environment. So I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, I will mention a study that we did recently that was actually funded by the AAMC and EGEA. And it was a multi-institutional study. The team that represented George uh, Washington University received funding from George Washington University. Okay, so what I wanna do today is really talk about the concept of trust and learner trustworthiness, right? In how we supervise them in the clinical setting. Think about the five um, learner factors that enable uh, trust, but then also talk about the learner experiences with that, um, including sort of the experience with over and under trust. And then think about how learner trust and their trust in learning environment can bring forth desirable and undesirable learning behaviors. Okay. So one of the reasons I think that we should talk about trust and entrustment is for all of us that work with learners, with students and residents and fellows is 
we actually make entrustment or trust decisions every single day, right? Because in addition to the trust relationship we have with patients, we think about learners as sort of agents of ours in providing care to our patients. And we make decisions about what responsibilities we're willing to hand over to which learners to do, right, on our behalf and with how much supervision. So in order for us to talk about what's happened in the clinical environment, I do wanna take a step back and really talk about, well, how does teaching and learning work in the workplace? And really, if you look at the history of time, throughout the history of time, professions, professionals learn their professions actually through apprenticeships. It's only in recent human history that we have formal schooling, okay? And Lee Shulman of the Carnegie Foundation, you know, which is here in the Bay Area, uh, did research looking at learning in medicine, in nursing, and in the ministry and law. And what he found was that there was really a common thread of apprenticeships. And there were three threads within that. He talks about the apprenticeship of the mind, the apprenticeship of the hand, and the apprenticeship of the heart, right? How we think, the, skill, the skills that we have, what we do, and then really our ethics, our morals, the values that we hold dear, right? And he talks about how, you know, people don't come and just learn medicine, for instance. They're really socialized into the field, right? They're socialized to really um, uh, embrace the values that we have. And this happens, right, through observation, um, through coaching that we provide, and through practice. So in um, the late 1980s, early 1990s, there were two Berkeley professors. One was a social anthropologist um, and one was an education scientist went and really studied apprenticeships in depth. And they came up with a theory that they call situated learning. And what that means is that you learn best when you learn the information in the context in which you're going to use it. You learn through social interactions with the people there and you learn by doing. So what they did was they offered a different conceptualization of learning that we don't learn as acquisition of knowledge, but we learn by participating, right? So people talk about workplace-based learning as learning through participation. You can only learn if you participate. So if we think about the student or the resident or the fellow, say this is a student. So they actually, when they enter medical school and enter clerkships, they join a clinical community of practice, right? So you know, here's the healthcare team, they're joining the healthcare team. And what we do is we say, we start them off at the periphery. So we break off pieces of responsibility for them to do so they can participate in patient care activities. But we, we, we're at the periphery because these are low risk things, right? So if, you know, they fail, if they stumble, it has less risk to the patient. And then over time, what they do is they get more and more responsibility until they become a central part of that community of practice. And we do this, we think about our residents and our fellows by balancing supervision and the amount of autonomy and the amount of responsibility that we provide our learners, okay? So people became really interested in this idea of supervision in, um, about 20 years ago. So Terry Kennedy, who's Canadian, did a seminal study where she started to look at supervision in the workplace and people had never thought about it beforehand. Again, things that we do implicitly and we don't really give a thought to, right? And what she found was that there are four different types of supervision that are listed here, right? Um, and so routine oversight where we sort of, this is what we do for everyone. We plan this in advance. There's responsive oversight, you know, because this particular resident needs something more from us or this particular fellow. Backstage oversight, we're double checking something, right, with the patient or the labs that the, the student or the resident may not realize that we're double checking. And then there are times where we have to take over um, and provide direct patient care, okay? But in addition to different types of supervision, when I talk about that balance of supervision and autonomy, we can also think about degrees of supervision and autonomy, right? So, um, and I apologize that these are not psychiatry examples. I couldn't figure out how to find psychiatry pictures, <laughs> right? But this is, you know, as a pediatrician, I always think about ear exams. So in the beginning, right, we're in there with the learner, 
I'm providing direct supervision, right? At some point I say, go ahead, you're ready to go in and do this on your own. And then you come out and report to me. So that's indirect supervision. At some point, you know, this is uh, the intensive care nursery. Maybe I don't even need to be on the floor, right? I'm somewhere in the hospital and you call me when you need me. And at some later point, maybe you go to a conference downtown and you're not even in the hospital, right? Um, and so there's ways in terms of thinking about degrees of supervision that we provide. Now circling, oh, and at some point we say, you're ready, kick you out of the nest, you can fly on your own, right? So we can think about supervision then as sort of being linked to entrustment. So this is actually a picture of me with a former UCSF medical student. This is when I used to attend in the pediatric urgent care clinic. And the students come in and they want to do IVs in a pediatric patient, right? And I used to say, well, I'll let you attempt an IV in a pediatric patient if you can do one on me, right? And it's how I decide then how much supervision I will provide, how much I trust you, right, to then do this IV in a student. So that's why I've been talking about supervision because it really comes hand in hand because it related to our entrustment decisions. Okay. Now, from a supervisor perspective, when we think about entrustment, there are implications for this, right? So when we trust someone, right, to act as our agent, we're actually making ourselves vulnerable, right? If I carve off a patient care responsibility, I hand it to this fellow, a uh, fellow stumbles, right? That reflects on me, my team, and the care we are providing, right, at UCSF. Um, we're making calculated risks that these stumbles, these adverse events, are ones that are acceptable that we can recover from. So when we talk to surgeons, they'll talk about how they're willing to let someone get to a certain point, and that point is what they feel like they are able to salvage, right? So beyond that, they don't think they can rescue the situation, so then they're very careful about crossing that line. Um, and this requires us to really estimate also someone's adaptive competence, right? Because every single patient is different. You see one patient with depression, that's one patient with depression. There's unique um, aspects about the next patient. So it's not just about competence, but adaptive competence. So when we're thinking about our learners, it's also their ability to cope with an unexpected situation that might come up with that particular patient. And when you think about when we put a stamp of approval on a medical student or a resident or a fellow, the reality is we are certifying them for practice for activities that we have, may not have ever seen them do, right? Especially for rare things. And for very rare things, may, 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 may have also not encountered it during training, right? So this is also a level of entrustment. Every time we certify someone that's finishing our program, we're entrusting they're gonna have adaptive competence to manage whatever comes up for them in practice, okay? So that then led to all sorts of questions about, so then how do we make, given all that, how do we decide? How do we make decisions about what responsibilities they hand over and how much supervision to provide? So Tara Kennedy, who started that work on supervision, then expanded her work and she did a qualitative study where she followed around medicine and emergency medicine teams for three hour chunks to observe what was happening. And she also created these videos where, for instance, a resident uh, did something wrong because they hadn't checked in with an attending. And then really talk people through what are all the factors that go into them making a decision. And she came up with what she calls four dimensions of trustworthiness. Right? That one, people take into account the knowledge and skill of the learner. Two is this, do they have discernment? And she defines this as an awareness of their limits. Right? Do they understand that they're now in over their head? Okay. Conscientiousness, so are they thorough? Are they dependable? Um, and the last part is truthfulness, which is that absence of de deception. Okay. So she really started the ball rolling of now people being much more explicit in thinking about what is happening in our supervision and in our trust decisions. And since 2008, there have been multiple, multiple, multiple studies. They've looked at, at how attendings make decisions, how residents or fellows make decisions on junior learners. They've studied this in anesthesia and OB-GYN and pediatrics and surgery veterinary medicine. I haven't found one in psychiatry and I'd be really, really interested. 
Um, and what you find is that everyone talks about these qualities differently. Um, these papers show a range of three to 24 categories. Retair Kennedy had the four and they use different terminologies, even though the concepts overlap, it was sort of really hard to sort of figure out what was going on. So Ola Tenkati and I did essentially a narrative review of these papers and distilled it down to five factors, which are really covered in all of these studies. And one is capability. This is a knowledge skills that Tara Kennedy talked about, but also how much experience they've had and then situational awareness, okay? Reliability is not just whether they're conscientious, but also whether they're predictable. So sometimes we work with residents have really, really good days and really, really bad days, and you never know whether they're having a good day or a bad day. And that's difficult versus the second resident who has very consistent performance, regardless of whether they're having a good day or a bad day, right? Um, whether the learners hold themselves accountable, right? And whether they're responsible, right? Um, do they do what they say they're going to do? Integrity, um, we defined as being truthful, but also being benevolent, doing what's best for the patient and being patient-centered. Humility is that discernment category, right? So it's recognizing limits, but in addition to recognizing limits, being willing to ask for help and then being willing to receive feedback. And this is important, feedback from, uh, from people other than other medical professionals, right? Being willing to listen to the nurse, being willing to listen to the allied, other allied health professionals. And then agency is being proactive to their own work, but also to the team, to patient safety and their own personal development and growth. Right? So then if you take the first letter of these five factors and rearrange them, you can say that these are the five factors that I need to make a rich entrustment decision, right? Now, what we haven't done is to say, so here are the five, but how are the five in relation to each other? And are some, are they always the same or do we weigh some factors more in certain situations? And that work still needs to be done. And I will also say, that as, as there's been so much increased interest in this idea of supervision and entrustment is people have also started to say, maybe it's um, more complex than we think it is. So there's a recent study in 2022 out of Canada that looked at how medicine does it, and they feel like it's different than a procedural field like surgery. And I bring this up because I wonder how this relates to what happens in psychiatry. So they talk about senior residents, right? And senior residents have a role that's sort of like a mini attending in terms of supervising their junior residents. And so when they talk about entrustment of their senior residents, they're finding that they're making two different types of entrustment decisions. They're entrusting them for that role right? It's pretty static in terms of that managerial role. And then they're also entrusting from for a specific task within that role. And for that task, they might ratchet up or decrease supervision depending on that particular task. Okay. So this is work that Karen Howard did is that also in the moment. So I've mentioned then there are learner factors and she looked at and through the literature and really summarized that it's not just the learner, there are other things that impact our decisions, right? So there's the learner and we talked about the five factors and then we also make decisions based on their learning needs. But we as supervisors vary. We have different clinical experiences. We have different trust propensities, right? We work with people who trust nobody <laughs> and people who trust everybody um, and how much experience we have supervising make a difference. The task makes a difference. How difficult is it, right? What are the risks involved in that particular task? Our relationship with the learner matters. Like, do we feel like this is someone who thinks just like me? We're very like-minded. I trust them, you know, very much. We share the same culture or they're so different that I just am uncomfortable with the decisions they're going to make. And then the context, right? Um, is it that I'm, I just need all hands on deck, right? And if you think about this, um, we allow learners to do a lot of things on call that we actually choose to supervise during the daytime, right? So all of this comes into play. So given that then, right, I think we've talked about from a supervisor perspective, we can think about the learner, but how did learners experience this, right? So tale of two programs, okay? And actually both of this involves UCSF students. So the first study, was a study done on clerkship students at UCSF in the traditional clerkship. They chose to study clerkship students because they're at the bottom of the totem pole, 
right? So everything kind of, the trust decisions happen to them. So how do they experience it? Right? And what they found is that the learners recognize there are a lot of factors involved, but they didn't recognize really the learner factors, like how they might impact those decisions. And they were mostly just very frustrated. There was a sense that these decisions happen to them. They have no control over it. They don't know how these decisions are made. Sometimes they have appropriate supervision and trust. Sometimes they're under-trusted. Sometimes they're over-trusted. And this impacts the learning environment for them and it impacts their sense of patient care safety, right? But they also felt really uncomfortable addressing what they felt was inappropriate trust, right? Because of the grading and the performance issues involved, right? And so then they just left them really stressed out. And this is opposed to, we ran a pilot here at UCSF and three other medical schools where we told students that we were um, making explicit entrustment decisions. And we told them that these are all the factors that go into entrustment decisions. And the idea behind your training is that we want to be able to trust you with more and more responsibility until you get to a certain level of autonomy or independence, right? Focus groups were ran and we asked them about their experience with entrustment. And here, what we found was that this learners really recognized the influence on decisions. And they were able to know that there are some decisions, some factors they have no control over, the complexity of the situation, right? Whether the supervisor are more or less likely to trust, and they were able to let go of that. But they also understood that there were elements that they had control over. So they had control over how their relationship was with the supervisor, and they had control over how the supervisors perceived them in terms of the learner factors. And so they would say things like, I would admit when I don't know something because that would gain the trust of the faculty member. And I know that that means they'll give me more responsibility next time, right? Um, and so they were very deliberate in influencing um, the decisions. And they were, they talked about how they deliberately demonstrated agency, reliability, integrity, capability, and humility in order to drive for their trust. And the best part was they would negotiate when they thought that there was under and over trust because trust was being made so explicit. So they would show up and sometimes the faculty member would say, oh, you're a third year student. We don't expect anything from you. Just come and observe. And the students would say, no, actually I'm capable of more. So how about I go in, I manage this um, interaction with the patient, but you can observe me and you can jump in whenever you feel like you need to, right? And there are also times where the faculty would say to the student, I think you're ready to do this, right? Go in and do this on your own. And the students say, no, actually I've only ever done this once. I don't know that I'm safe yet doing this and I would like you to be in the room with me. Okay. So I think for me, the lesson is that it's very helpful when we make entrustment explicit. Right. And we can be explicit with our um, learners that we're making these and with ourselves that we make these decisions um, based on patient safety and based on their learning needs and preparing them for independent practice. OK. And we can be very deliberate about developing, assessing and holding them accountable for these five factors that we've talked about. And part of the ways that we can do that is, and we have found that in programs where they're make, when they make entrustment explicit is it influences how they give feedback, right? And how learners seek feedback. Because then the students were asking, so what can I do differently next time so you will give me more responsibility? Not did I do well or did I do poorly, right? And it allows the faculty to say, you know, I would feel more comfortable giving you more responsibility next time if X, Y, or Z, including if you would admit when you didn't know something and would come and get me. So we talked about these learner factors. I'm gonna focus on two, integrity and humility, okay? So we've talked about the, th the things that we wanna see, how we make our decisions, how students experience those decisions. And I wanna also talk a little bit more about our interaction with students around these two things, okay? One is that we approach this with, this is what I wanna see for integrity. This is what I wanna see for humility. And when our learners, don't demonstrate the things that we want to see, what do we do, right? We blame the learners. There is something wrong with this person. The residency program needs to do better about who they ma match into the residency program. The medical school needs to do better, right? But really the question is, 
you know, when we think about these um, behaviors, are these really traits, you know, immutable traits where it's something that someone brings with them and we just have to do a better job of screening, or is this an issue of state and that it's influenced by context, right? And the social sciences would tell us that it's really about state. So Bandura social learning theory would say that there's a triadic reciprocal causation between the person and what they bring to the table, right? Their sort of character and morals and so forth. And then how they interact with the environment, right? And what they expect the response of the actions to be from the environment and the impact on them. So it's all very much related. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about a study that we did uh, recently in the pre-clinical curriculum because the faculty were so incredibly frustrated that students were sharing information with each other when they weren't supposed to, telling each other what was gonna be on the OSCE, working together when they were asked to work alone, okay? And so we call this unauthorized collaborations, it's also known in the literature as collaborative cheating. And we interviewed the students and the faculty at three different institutions, Georgetown, George Washington, and the Uniform Services. We gave them these scenarios and then asked them their perceptions of what was happening in these scenarios. Like, why did the students do what they did, right? And what are the conditions that might have influenced that? So two of the themes that we found three themes, but two of them really relate to trust, right? So our themes were around tensions. So there's a big tension between the faculty and the curriculum's goals versus the students' goals, right? Our goals are we want them, we want to be making good doctors. Right? We want these to be learning experiences. Students' goals are they just need to survive and stay in medical school, okay? Um, and there's a lot of stuff that came up around trust faculty intent and trust in the value and quality of the curriculum. And what do I mean by that, right? So if I trust that you care about me and you design this experience for me to wrestle with it because it's gonna be ultimately a good le learning experience, I'll do it, right? If I think that the reason this was difficult is because you put no thought into this, right? Because you're a faculty, you don't really care. You, you didn't put thought into your exam questions. You didn't put thought into this. So then why should I put any effort into this, right? So I'm just going to circumvent you. Um, and similarly, we, we found a, a lot about the relationship with their peers versus the relationship with the system, right? And this was really about trust in our educational system and trust in our policies. So they have a friend, right? Their friend is struggling. If they don't trust the school to help that friend, then they will circumvent the system to help that friend because they're not going to let that friend be kicked out of med school, even if that means that they're going to cheat to help that friend. Okay. So this is a quote I'm going to share from our study because I really liked it, right? The buzzword is trust, right? I think at least in part, these sorts of behaviors represent just a fundamental mistrust of everything that's in the system, whether it's at the faculty level, the school, part of the whole medical education process. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with students who feel that any stumble in medical school is going to ruin the rest of their lives. And I think in many ways contributes to students feeling justified in doing it, okay? So really it's this idea that trust is a two-way street, right? Not only do we talk about our trust in students, right? Um, and our residents and fellows, but it's also about how they trust us. And that has implications for how we set up our learning environment. So I really like this quote from the Macy Foundation. They had put together a conference to look at the learning environment. And they said that there are attributes that we desire in our learners. And the learning environment should bring forth these attributes. And we, right, we, all of us, we are the stewards of that learning environment. So my question for us then is, are we trustworthy? Right? Do we model the behaviors that we want them to see? Do we create an environment where it's safe for them to say they don't know or that they overslept and therefore didn't pre-round? Right? So then when I talk about the learning environment, um, I realize that that is essentially everything that surrounds learning. So very big. So how do we break that down and think about it? So Larry Gruppen came up with a model, which I liked. Where he says there's really four components to the learning environment. There's the personal the social, organizational, physical, and virtual spaces. So I won't talk about the physical and virtual spaces. The personal is what the students bring to the table. We have some students who are more trusting to begin with and students who are less trusting. The social aspect is their, in, is their relationships and interactions with all of us, right? With teachers and with other team members. The organization 
is then their experience of the policies and the systems, right? And we can think of this as the microsystem on a rotation in a unit um, or at the larger level, the residency program or the institution. Okay. So when we ask, are we trustworthy? We can ask, are we trustworthy as teachers? Are we trustworthy as programs and as institutions, right? So we focus on teachers. So David Sklar, who was um, uh, the editor in chief of academic medicine uh, several years back, he wrote, he wrote a lot about trust being a two way street. And he says that in order for learners to really engage in learning, they have to have trust in their teachers. They have to trust in our competence in our professionalism and in our interest and commitment to them, okay? And so they're also, you know, in the 2000s, a lot of interest in learning environment and how we create safety, right? So um, Tilio talks about this idea of, of the educational alliance. We often talk about the therapeutic alliance with our patients and he, um, and they took that and said, well, let's think about the educational alliance, right? And related to that, people have also, started to write about creating a just culture, just culture for our learners, meaning that they don't get humiliated, right? They don't get shamed. It's okay for them to ask questions and it's okay for them to disagree with us, right? And others have talked about this idea of it's all about fostering psychological safety, where it's a safe, where people, learners feel safe to explore. And as part of that exploration, feel safe to fail, right? Um, and, um, and feel safe to not be at their best and that we're there to support them. So, and this was a, a, a quote from one of the papers that I really like. So I feel pretty safe to completely land on my face if I needed to. And knowing that my attendings were going to think that I wasn't trying hard or anything like that. So I was willing to do my best and I didn't, but I didn't really know what I was doing, knowing that my attendings were there to help me through it and to teach me how to do it properly, rather than judge me for not doing it right the first time. When I've spent time with educationalists, they've always said that they were very confused by medical education people. And she said that medical education is one, probably the only place in education where we expect our learners to arrive already knowing what it was that we were supposed to teach them. Right. So we get upset at the student who shows up at the pediatric courtship, not knowing pediatrics. And they say we're very happy with the learner who knows everything about pediatrics. But wasn't that my job to teach them? Right. So the question for us is, when our students struggle, do we say, and this actually came out the mouth of one of my faculty members, do we say, it's not my fault if they're too stupid to be in medical school? Right. Or do we say, this came out of the mouth of another faculty member, if you guys don't ever understand anything, right, it's not your fault, but my fault, then please let me know because it means I'm not saying something right, that I'm not explaining it right, right? So what kind of teacher are we? So now let's talk about program and institution. So are we doing on time? Okay. So again, Scholar talks about engagement and learning, trust in teachers, but also trust in the educational program and the institution. And what that means is trusting the system and the processes, trusting the policies and trusting the resources. And so let me break that down, right? So if you think about it, one of the systems and processes that we have that are so challenging for our learners, especially for students, is the sense that they're constantly being assessed everything that they do, right? And the reason I have the figure skater is that when we think about our sports teams, they have a space where they get to practice and be coached where they're not actually performing, right? But our students feel like they're always performing. Now, one of the things that's been so nice here at UCSF is really the institution of a, ro a very robust coaching program right? And the coach is someone who doesn't have any evaluative role. It's like they're there to coach and help the learner be successful, to try to do what we do in music and in sports. And there was a paper that was recently published by Karen Hauer um, that showed that one of the key things that made the program so successful was the trust, right? It was the student trust in their coaches, student trust in what the program was designed to do. Think we also need to think about there's the processes, there's also things that are a little hard to get at, which are program and departmental culture, right? It's not written down anywhere, but it's pervasive. And this is here because 
this was my experience when I was here for pediatrics is that we would have children admitted to the wards um, and we would need to consult orthopedics, right? But the orthopedics department had a very strong culture of if you as an intern couldn't handle the situation and had to call the resident or the attending, you were weak, right? Your job is to block, right? You're a gatekeeper. Your job is to block access to your resident and your attending, and that made you strong. And that meant that we could never get a hold of the pediatric orthopedist, even though the intern didn't know anything about taking care of a child, right? Um, it was so frustrating and so dangerous, patient safety-wise, that the pediatric orthopedist at that time gave out his personal cell phone number to every single pediatric resident and said, bypass the residents, just call me directly, right? But think about that. It has huge implications for the learning of those residents. So you're training an entire cohort of residents who don't know how to take care of children, right? Okay. Many of our policies expect the worst of our learners. Um, not so much here at UCSF, but I'll say at Georgetown, if you have a grandparent die and you say, I'm so sorry, I want time off, you know, I have a grandparent who died, Georgetown does not say, oh, I'm so sorry, take as much time as you need. Georgetown says, I'm going to need an obituary or a death certificate to prove that your grandmother actually did die. Okay. You know, think about a resident who shows up late and they say, I'm sorry, my car broke down on my way in. Do you say, oh, I'm so sorry, like, let's catch you up. Or do you say, I'm going to need a receipt from that tow truck? to prove to me that you're not lying, right? And when we are part of programs and institutions that have policies like that, think of the message we're sending, right? Georgetown is essentially saying to every single student, you're a liar until proven otherwise, right? You're all liars, you're all here to cheat the system, can't trust you. And what kind of relationship does that set up, right? Between the students and the institution. And the last part, and this is what we found in our study, right? This idea of, as a learner, if you stumble and fail, does a program say, I wash my hands of you, we kick you out, you don't belong here in medical school, you don't belong in our residency program? Or do we say, we're gonna pull in additional resources and we're gonna help you across that finish line, right? And what we found in our study is, at least at a medical school level, in the preclinical level, there's not that trust that the school is gonna pull in additional resources, they're gonna kick me out. Right? So we have the band together and make sure we all survive. Okay. The other thing is, you know, I asked that question of, are we trustworthy? But as I mentioned, right, you know, our policies, it's not sort of yes or no, there's this whole spectrum. So I think really the question is how trustworthy are we, right? And are there places where we can move that bar where we're more trustworthy than wherever we are now? And the one last thing I wanna say and this is something we're paying a lot of attention to at Georgetown, is that we also tend to think about all learners as one group. We tend, and then when we talk about creating the environment, we're sort of environment in general. But I think it's important to point out that not all learners experience the environment the same way. And really the environment's not the same for all of them, right? And this is a quote from the Harvard Business Review, which is really about business world, but I like this. And it really says that our organizational structures, our practices and our patterns of interactions actually do position groups of learners differently, right? And they create different experiences for them. And then groups respond differently due to differences in these situations. We had a student tell us that she was told when she wore her hair in a more natural state, that she looked unkempt and unprofessional, right? She then spent her entire rotation running to the bathroom every 45 minutes to an hour to check her hair, okay? How can you learn when you're focused on whether your team thinks you're unkempt and unprofessional, right? So I think, this is one thing, like when we're talking about the learning mind, we have to be careful about thinking about every single group of our learners, right? Not just the majority. Okay, so in summary, right? We talked about how we as supervising clinicians, we operationalize trust daily in balancing supervision and learner autonomy for safe patient care, right? Sometimes we do this without thinking about it. In fact, my six o'clock morning, I had a meeting this morning at 6 a.m. talking about trust. <laughs> an international group and we were very much talking about how for a lot of people 
it's implicit and we don't really break it down and think about it, right? And what I wanted us to do today was make it more explicit so that we pause and think about it and can be more deliberate in how we approach it. We talked about the factors that influence these trust or supervision dis decisions, including learner integrity and humility. And then the big important thing I really wanted us to think about was that our learners can really only demonstrate trustworthy behaviors when we're trustworthy, okay? The final questions I wanna leave you guys with to think about is, so how can we become more trustworthy in our learners' eyes, right? As individuals, as programs, as an institution? And then what steps can we take now and later to really improve trust in the learning environment? Okay, and I'm happy to answer any questions. realize it whipped through that so quickly, I'm sorry. <laughs> but hopefully that means we have more time for questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's such a wonderful perspective because I would argue that not everyone sees that or not everyone shares that perspective, right? Um, so if we think about the idea of psychological safety, how do we even frame that for our learners to welcome them into the space and actually say, you know what? The thing that you bring, the way you add value, right? To our group is you see things that we're not able to see, right? So there's power in that and I wanna hear, right? Please share that with us. Please point out things that we may take for granted, but we don't always do that, right? And, and um, I think some learners experience um, pushback and challenge when they do voice things that are not in line with the company line, right? Um, when they point out things that the team doesn't wanna think about. And in some ways, the more our learners are different from whatever the accepted culture is of the team, the more friction there is and the less, less safe it is for them, right? So then the onus really is on us to invite that. You know, it's very easy for me to sit here and say, oh, you know, um, we want our students to admit that they don't know something, you know, but I always say that, and I think back to my own training, handful, handful of times where someone has said, thank you for saying that you didn't know, but usually we're, we're um, either we feel shame ourselves or someone, right, has us feel some shame that we don't know. And, um, and I, I always count on, there's one time, usually sometimes when I think I have more time, I share this story of when I was a medical student and I did uh, on a rotation in Pete's endocrine and I was given a stack of papers to read on a Friday. Of course, I didn't read it. And so on Monday, the faculty member like drew up the serogenesis pathway, gave a case, handed me a piece of chalk and said, go up there and show me where the defect is. And I said, you know what? I'm so sorry. I didn't read any of the papers you gave me. So I couldn't begin to tell you. Right. And there was absolute silence. The fellow was appalled. The other student was appalled. And he came up to me and he slammed his hands on the table. And I thought, I'm such a dead woman. Right. And he said, that is a damn good answer because these are people's lives we're dealing with. And when we don't know, we need to say we don't know. Right. And that always stuck out with me. And even when I think about myself, when have I done that for a learner? Right, we just forget. To be fair and equitable to the people online, we have some questions also. Um, Descartes, uh, we know that you are on Zoom and feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, Carrie, this is Descartes Lee. Um, Hi, thank Hi. you for your talk. So I'm coming out as a uh, disembodied voice, I'm sure, <laughs> over there. Uh, but thank you so much for the talk. I, I was, you know, I think I've been interested recently in the topics of professionalism 
And mm -hmm. this, I think there's a huge overlap with trustworthiness. And then the mm -hmm. other topic I've been interested in is this issue of um, actual uh, a blow, uh, uh, going back to the old days. And when I say old days, the really old days in terms of virtues. So Aristotle uh -huh. had this idea of how you tap into virtues and talking about the factors that go into uh, that you mentioned that go into a readiness for entrustment, you know, capability, reliability. Mm -hmm. Those are all like vir Aristotelian virtues. And I don't think we are in like, and, and Aristotle had this whole thing about how you can improve the culture and how you cultivate um, virtues in people. And I think we really lo we lose out when we don't think of it that way. We're all individually trying to do trustworthy things and trying to imbue our uh, students with being more trustworthy, but we haven't taken a really big picture and been explicit about like, how do we make a culture that promotes virtue or promotes trustworthiness? Um, just, that's a comment, not really a question, Carrie, but. Yeah, no, but I, I love that comment. And that, and that's why, for instance, I like to make this explicit in talking about trust, right? Because part of it is how can we make this explicit and actually talk about it and promote it and explain it to our learners? I think one of the, the I, I love that you link this to professionalism because one of the challenges with professionalism, the way typically it's handled at medical schools is we don't actually really teach it, right? We just say that these are things we expect. Students don't, students and learners don't even know where the boundaries are. You only know where the boundary is when you've crossed it and someone slaps you upside the head, right? And said that you are bad because you've crossed our boundary. Um, and so we, we have these expectations um, around professionalism, but we don't really teach it and we don't really coach people up in it. So I love what you're saying is sort of this idea of if there are, again, attributes, virtues, whatever we wanna call them, but we want to see in our learners, one is how do we first make that explicit with the learners, create an environment that supports that, and then how do we actually teach it, right? How do we grow that and promote that? Um, but we tend, again, we tend to treat character, virtues, professionalism as traits rather than states, right? Let's select for them, right? Rather than what are the things that we can do to really promote it um, and, you know, Macy would say that if you create an environment where you sort of drive certain behaviors, over time, those behaviors become ingrained, right? And they become habits. And this is how you help people, right? Sort of be more quote unquote professional or be more virtuous as you try to make those behaviors ingrained habits. Hi, Marina Tulusham. Thank you so much for a great talk. I was listening on Zoom as I was coming in. And um, I, I'm kind of, I'm curious to hear about your thoughts. Like this, a lot of what you're talking about too is thinking about shifting norms. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of actually norm interventions done, mm -hmm. right? With communities around mm -hmm. certain campaign, right? Trying behavioral change. And I'm curious um, what discussion might be happening like at the higher structural level around these shifts, as well as you're talking about modifying environments and um, those pieces? I think it varies from uh, school to school. So the, um, I like to talk about entrustment the way I talked about it today, because not everybody uh, uses, you know, Eric had referenced my work in entrustable professional activities, which is one approach to competency-based education. So that is gaining a lot of traction internationally over the last few years. Um, but whether or not you buy into entrustable professional activities, whether or not you use that as your competency framework, again, we all make these stress decisions. So I like to drive this conversation as being relevant for all of us, whether or not we use EPAs. Um, I think that it helps that there has been a lot of international interest and also at the higher levels um, in EPA. So it's, it's bringing this idea of entrustment to the fore and having us really think about it. And then the reason I like to talk about this when I go to different places is to start to spark this sort of thinking, to sort of say what we're doing. And one thing I didn't say um, in relation to Descartes' comments, one thing that also is starting to happen is when we think of our definitions of professionalism, and I mentioned that, um, like about that learner and her hair, is who made those definitions, right? And so that is another thing, is going back to the drawing board and to say, 
how did how did we come up with these definitions for what professionalism is, and does it disadvantage certain groups? Um, and so, do we need to really rethink that and really think about what truly what it truly means to be professional in medicine? And maybe it's not so much about what your hair looks like. Right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Hi, really interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about your your example with the OSCE and the students mm -hmm. cheating, mm -hmm. uh, because of course I remember back in medical school and thinking how absurd it is. I can't talk to my yeah. colleagues about this formative experience. And you know, you were talking about how important it is to have this trust, and you were noticing yeah. these differences yeah. in trust for things like that. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to create a situation where trust doesn't even matter? Right where the teachers are setting it up such that the trust isn't going to come into play because I think in situations oh, yeah. like that, yeah. it's always going to be an issue where yes. students are yes. not going to trust the learn the, the teachers, yes. teachers are not going to trust students yeah. and they all have biases that yes. make it such that maybe we shouldn't yes. rely on trust in those situations. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that um, the third tension in that study was the whole uh, like uh, inherent traits versus versus behavioral states, right? Um, and there was uh, one of the quotes, also very beautiful, was sort of this idea that there are some students who will always cheat no matter what. And there are some students who will never cheat no matter what. And then you have all these students in the middle, right? Well, but um, there are also some teachers who right. are not trustworthy. Right, right. Because exactly. of different biases. Right? Exactly. There are inherent biases at play that neither side maybe should be trusted. Right. Um, and so you're talking about what are the structural things that you can put in place. And that definitely is something that, you know, so we can put uh, things when we went to Zoom and online, there are things that you can do in the in the virtual space, right? Uh, um, like the whole virtual proctoring. There are things you can give the exam to everybody all at the same time, right? Um, and I think so one of the things that came out is what are the environmental things that we can do, right, to just prevent that from happening, to make it less easy, not so that we don't tempt people to do it, right? Um, but I think for something like the OSCEs, um, if you think about, I think UCSF now has 176 students or something like that. So we don't have a space so large that you can do everybody all at the same time. Georgetown, we have 200 students per class. Um, our clinical skills center is smaller than the one at UCSF. And there's just no way we can do everybody, you know, and, and that's the case for a lot of schools. Um, and even outside the testing situation. So you design a case, it could be a problem-based learning case, a TBL case, could be any sort of case. Um, but if a senior student tells the junior students all about the case, they don't have, they don't get the experience of experiencing the case, right? You know, and I, I think what struck me was that when I was at UCSF, I was in charge of the preclinical problem-based learning curriculum and the preclinical OSCEs, including sort of the big OSCE that they all have to pass in order to start clerkships. There was very little leakage. We used the same cases. Um, there was one case that was very challenging for students in the second year. They never leaked it because they found it such a positive learning experience. They would say to the first years, oh, wait till we get to the second year. Or they would say, oh, you're doing rage, you know? <laughs> so, um, and then when I got to Georgetown, completely different environment and I just didn't get it, you know? And I was like, I don't know what's happening. Um, and, uh, so it was just trying to figure out, so what is going on in the cultures of these two different institutions and why is there such lack of trust, right? In the curricular program and in the faculty at Georgetown that's leading to all these sorts of behaviors. And I will say also that just because we have time that um, this, that study was actually inspired by my niece. So she had um, just started uh, COVID hit, they all went to Zoom. And one day she was complaining about how her teacher had shut off uh, personal chats, right? You know, rolling her eyes at her teacher. And, and the way she explained it was that her teacher was unreasonable, gave these like very long reading assignments that no one could ever finish, right? Only gave them a day or a night to read it. In the morning, but cold call on students. And when students hadn't finished the reading, couldn't answer the question, she would humiliate them in front of everybody. So of course they would private chat answers to each other to protect each other from that humiliation, right? And then she got angry when she found out and shut it off, 
right? You know, and so that's sort of the, oh, okay, we'll implement a systemic sort of solution to the problem. But I would say the problem there was more that underlying culture and that the tension between the students and the teacher. For those that are interested in the study, so um, Carrie's being very humble. Um, this particular qualitative study on unauthorized collaborations was selected in um, Academic Medicine's Research and Medical Education series, and the podcast version of it is amazing. So if you're curious about this particular study and some of its um, additional implications and recommendations, check out the Academic Medicine's podcast on unauthorized collaborations. Um, and I will piggyback a little bit on this content. I love the story of your niece. <laughs> um, so one of the questions in the chat is around trustworthiness um, and how do we build that um, in what is at least by many um, perceived um, corporatization of medicine and how, how do we actually think about building a trustworthy culture when there are strong motivators perhaps financial at play that might undermine our ability to trust the system as a whole. Um, yeah, I have no solutions, right? I, um, but, but I would say that it's something I didn't bring up, which that gets at is we as faculty need to trust our systems, right? So I'm talking about sort of the learners and us, but how we function in the space and who we can be with our learners also rests on our trust of the school and UC, yes, UCSF and how we're treated for our behavior. So, so I just want to acknowledge that there are those layers. And I don't know, and it's, um, I think when we're all under duress, right, whatever the duress is, when we're all under duress is we tend to shut off and we sort of pull in and we go into a protective space, right? And the challenge with trust is we think about it, when you trust someone, you're making yourself vulnerable for them, right? Vulnerable to them. When we tell our students or residents or fellows that we want them to tell us when they don't know something, we want them to be honest with us when they've um, you know, made a mistake or stumbled, we're asking them to be vulnerable. Right. Um, and when we make these decisions and when we say to the student, you know, you bring something new and different and I want you to share with it, we're also making ourselves vulnerable to a certain extent. And so the question is, when we're under duress, when there's all these things going on, is how might we be able to take a step back and say, at least in this one little space that I inhabit, can I go to a different place and be vulnerable? And I, I don't that for now, that's all I can think about. I think larger systems things, it's really hard. The culture is changing and I'm not sure what the solution is to that except to push back against it. Hi, thank you so much for a really interesting um, talk. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about, I, I actually wrote this in the chat, but that we also are part of an organization that has many different cultures. You know, yes. each specialty has a culture, yes. even yes. within a specialty, subspecialties have yes. cultures. Uh, and then we work with other teams, finances, mm -hmm. nursing, mm -hmm. the unions. We work with a lot of teams. And I feel like one overarching theme is that there is not often an awareness of okay, in this culture, how do you define trust? How do you mm -hmm. vet people mm -hmm. for trust? And it's, it's actually pretty critical because in our medical cultures, you know, what seems to be the case is that trust is a little bit categorical. So mm -hmm. like we, we mm -hmm. it, it's probably based on the connection we feel with people, trust and connection are very related. So we trust people and then we mistrust others often based on one or two experiences yes. or even rumors, right? Yes. Whereas for example, if I'm on the finance team and I had a recent ex uh, experience uh, where I really took that in, the idea that you would trust, for example, somebody to sign off money when there would be a conflict of interest where you could give that money to yourself, that must be like in that culture, an absolute no-no that nobody would make. But in the medical culture, you may extend trust like a guy would to another guy, like I'm gonna trust you with my life. And in that culture, you would potentially sort of not heed those boundaries that the financial culture, for example, would tell you are absolutely necessary. Otherwise you, you pay the price, right? So I think 
I don't know that there is a solution, but I think the solution heads towards unpacking some of that very clearly so that there is an awareness, just like when you go to another country or that, mm -hmm. that essentially the culture is coming from values that are more valued, <laughs> like yeah. basically what the values are. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And, and one thing I didn't bring up is that um, a lot of the initial research on trust and the trust work actually comes out of the business world. Um, and I don't reference that um, because we've taken that and then evolved it more into what we think fits us in the medical world. Um, and so all the studies that I talked about and the references I've made have been then when we've taken it and further sort of expanded upon it and applied it to our space um, in medicine because it's, um, it's a little more nuanced in terms of when you're trusting someone to be your agent in patient care and then the trust between the patient and, and the physician, right? Um, and between the patient and the learner versus you and the health system, it gets very complicated. And so some of this um, hopefully gets more relevant to us than some of the initial work done by Mayer and people in the business world. Um, but yeah, I think the other thing that um, our residents and our students struggle with is the cultural differences, right? So students might behave a certain way in pediatrics and be welcome to do so, but they take that same behavior and they go to a different department and now their team is angry at them, right? And some of our students are better anthropologists and they can kind of suss out what the culture is and adjust accordingly. And some of our students are not. And they're thinking, well, but I was welcomed to share and to point out things on this rotation in psychiatry with this attending, and now I go on to you know this other rotation. I don't know why they're all mad at me, right? And similarly from div division to division. And so, um, and again, the more we can be explicit with our learners as to why we're doing certain things helps them. When everything's implicit, they don't really understand what they can carry forth into different places. And you know, sometimes when I'm advising students. I say, ideally, this is what we want the learning environment to be for them. And I always say, I don't have control over the residents. I don't have control over the faculty. I like to think right, that we're sort of in this space, but any individual that you encounter may be in a different space, right? So how do you suss that out? How do you dip a toe in, right, without jumping full on in? And how do you negotiate that space in a way that, especially for our learners, Right, they're at the bottom of the totem pole, right? Where it, it, they don't get into trouble. All right, well, we are at time. Um, Carrie, thank you so much for a very thought provoking uh, grand rounds. I want to appreciate everyone's um, questions and participation, and thank you very much. <laughs>